At Resilient Coders, we get in front of young people from traditionally underserved areas, and we teach them to code. We do this as a way of aligning them with a lucrative and meaningful career path. But I have to tell you that the coding itself is almost incidental. Really, it comes down to how we relate to our young people. So we don't really treat them as students per se, but rather as investors of their time and their energy. And here's what I mean. When I was their age, I did not love high school. Not because I struggled academically or socially. I, I was fine. I didn't love high school because at the time, I found it to be pointless. I didn't get it. I didn't understand the value of it. And every time I'd sit down to read another chapter of Wuthering Heights, I would think, why? Dear God, why? I had a vague notion of the fact that it was good for me to do. But I couldn't help but wonder, is this more important than the stuff that we're not learning? Is this more important than, say, personal finance? Business management, how to, how to hold down a job? Computer science, digital arts? I didn't think so, so I used to rebel in my own ridiculous way. And I find little ways here and there of sort of hacking the high school experience. I actually stopped reading Wuthering Heights. I actually stopped reading for class altogether. But I wouldn't let that get in the way of my grades. I would show up to the discussion. I'd listen to what my peers were saying. I'd keep an ear out for what the teacher was actually hoping to hear and read a paper on this. And that's kind of how I would sort of hack the experience, I guess. Um, I thought that I was being this huge, like, badass rebel at the time. But really and truly, I was engaging in something that's called sort of the customization of your environment, as Malcolm Gladwell calls it. Just finding a way to sort of hack that experience is a huge part of your intellectual upbringing. So I was talking to our technical advisor at Resilient Coders, who's this, this brilliant coder and entrepreneur named Chris. We're talking about this whole hacking the high school notion. And he told me that her, his first day of 10th grade chemistry, the, the teacher is rolling out the syllabus. And he says, all right, so your final is going to be worth 20% of your grade, unless you do better on the final than you did in the class, in which case we'll actually make it 100% of your grade. So this 15-year-old Chris, you're telling me that I can just bomb the class, and as long as I ace the final, I ace the class. Uh, yeah, technically that's correct, but no one would be dumb enough to do this. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> so there's 15-year-old Chris, meticulously maintaining a zero average in 10th grade chemistry, walks into the final, walks out with a 115. Now, traditional education has a word for kids like Chris, and believe it or not, that word is disengaged. Because what that word means is, this student is smart, but he's not buying what we're selling. He's not buying what we're selling. Because at the end of the day, traditional education is an investment opportunity that we ask our young people to make every morning when we drag them out of bed. And that investment looks like this. Look, you give us 12 years of your life, and at the end of that, maybe if you are lucky, and depending on who you are and where you come from, Maybe you'll have an opportunity to put in four more years of your life. And at the end of that, maybe you'll be at a baseline when it comes to competing with your peers for work. That's the investment on the table. It's amazing that anyone takes this deal. And by the way, Chris from 10th grade chemistry class did not. He chose not to go to college. And by the way, he's a brilliant coder and entrepreneur, very successful entrepreneur. So I suppose some of you might be wondering, OK, so why not? But see, I think that's the wrong question to ask. I don't think we should be asking why not. I think we should be asking why. Why should he? What's in it for him? Like, do we spend enough time telling the 15, 16, 17-year-old Chris's of the world what the point is? I want to take a minute to sort of further unpack this notion of education as an investment opportunity. Uh, I'm wondering, does anyone here work for a startup? All right, yeah. Welcome to Cambridge in Somerville. Um, so I'm going to pitch you this startup, and I, I want to sort of get a sense for how, whether or not you guys want to invest in this startup idea. The product is over 100 years old. Uh, it was designed for the industrial age. So I think it's safe to say we've nailed it. It's perfect. Uh, while some of you might think that the product is like deprecating, the pay to play, the barrier to entry, uh, or in this case, the amount of effort that an investor would need to put in to get something out, is as high as it's ever been, if not actually higher. Okay, so are, are, there, are there other investors in the deal? Yes, there are tons and tons of investors, but you see, they're disengaged. By which I mean to say that we know that they show up to work every day and they sit at a desk, but really they're investing in other opportunities. 
And lastly, you might ask me about market fit. Does the product actually speak to the needs of the market? To which I would say, nope. Nah. See, we don't worry about the needs of the market in our little world. We just, we kind of, we do our thing. And then our hope is that the market will come back to us. So how'd I do? You guys want to invest in my startup? You totally crushed the pitch. See, I actually have done some market research. And I can tell you that by the time our sophomores are graduating from college looking for work, 77% of those jobs available to them will require the sort of technical aptitude that they're not getting in school. In other words, if our educational system is preparing our kids for something, it's certainly not the workforce. I'll tell you about myself. I, I did choose to invest when I was a kid. Right, my parents immigrated to this country actually for academia. We lived out, I guess, our own sort of nerdy variant on the American dream. And I looked up at my parents, and I saw success. I saw two people doing what they loved to do. I looked around in my community, and I saw success. And so I made a decision based on the empirical evidence available to me, same natural skepticism, and I realized that to get from point A to point B, this is the vehicle that I would have to take. I would have to invest in education, and so I did. But now I can't help but wonder, looking back, what if my circumstances had been different? What if I looked up at my parents and I hadn't seen people doing what they loved to do? What if I looked around at my community and I saw traditional education failing, failing over and over and over again. Would I have made that same investment that I made? Because at that point, the investment looks like this. You put in 12 years of your life, and at the end of that, meh, we'll see what happens. Hell no. There's no way I would have made that investment. Why? Why? It's hard to say now what I would have done instead, right? Like, would I have been out there hustling drugs? Look, if I felt like I could get something out of it that was commensurate with the amount of effort that I was putting into it? Sure, maybe. Lord knows I had ample opportunity. But the fact of the matter is that I would have been out there looking for some sort of, some sort of a meritocracy. And by the way, this is a dangerous thing about ambitious young people who are disengaged from school because an investor with capital will invest in something. Young people who are not putting their energy into school are putting it somewhere else, and this is where we get this pervasive and toxic myth of basketball and hip-hop in our culture, or hockey and country music, whatever you want to call it. The point is, these kids look up at these stars, and they think, that to me is success. I need to do what they're doing so that I can be successful too. And what they're saying when our kids say this is, I need a path to success that does not rely on education. Because I don't believe that education will actually come through for me. That's what they're saying. So whenever we have a new cohort of young people at Resilient Coders, we go over this word meritocracy. I say, all right, look, merit is something that you're great at. And democracy is rule by the people, right? So meritocracy is rule by the great. In other words, you just worry about being great, and you can dominate your field. You just be good at this one thing, and you'll be fine. Can you just imagine how powerful that is for our kids to hear? Resilient coders, at the end of the day, is based on two principles. And again, coding, not one of them. It comes down to mutual accountability and transparency around the return on investment. Here's what that means. For mutual accountability, we have a web development shop that employs the young people who are ready for this challenge. Now, they know that in order for this to work out, I need to be out there pounding the pavement, hustling for work, bringing that in. But they also know that I know that when they get that work, they need to absolutely crush it. They need to do a great job. And see, the two of us need each other for this to work. You'd be amazed what that does to the power dynamic in the room. Remember, many of these kids are the same ones that kick their feet up on the desk at school, and they think, that guy up front, he doesn't care. But see, in this instance, we don't relate to each other as student and teacher. We are literally colleagues, mutually invested in the success of this business. And that is a game changer. The other thing I mentioned was transparency around the return on investment. Here's what I mean. I don't personally believe that you should have to wait 16 years to see a return on your investment. So I'll tell you what, give me an hour. Give me an hour, at the end of that, you will have built, built something, a very, very simple website with no platform, just in a text editor, but you will have built it yourself. You will have done that. Now, you give me a little bit more time than that, 
we can start to make that website look pretty cool. Like even six, eight, 10, 12 hours, we can get some styles in there, some layout, fonts, colors, awesome, cool. Now you give me more time than that, you might get to the point where other people out there pay you to do the same thing for them. Now if you really throw yourself into this trade, a full on, this can be a lucrative, meaningful career for you. The other thing we say to our young people is this. You will not be tested here. There is no homework. And while you might think that this sounds easier than school, believe me, it's not. Because we have these expectations of each other. See, I expect you to bring your own fire. You need to come hungry. Because I have a theory of change that if you take smart, ambitious young people and you put them in a room together, you give them a viable reason to succeed and the tools to do so, they will propel each other to build incredible things. All I have to do is light the spark and get the hell out of the way. So I guess the million dollar question is this. Does it actually work? You know, I thought about showing a slide with some stats and some numbers on it like I do for my funders, uh, but I'm gonna take a slightly different approach. And rather than give you numbers, I wanna talk to you about Lorenzo. Now, this young man over here is one of our young coders, and the first time that I tried to hand him a check, <laughs> the first time I tried to hand him a check, he gave it back to me and he said, you know, Dell, I was just doing this for fun. And I said to him, I know, I know, but we, sometimes we can be paid to do the thing that we love to do. And I can tell you about our man, Freddie. Uh, he's a brilliantly talented artist and he is a, he's a user interface designer, and he designed the iPhone app. Uh, he designed uh, the iPhone app for a, a local, hugely celebrated startup. Uh, hit number one for its category in the App Store the week it deployed. Uh, you can read about Wanderoo today in uh, Time Magazine and The Economist, and that, that was Freddie. Um, and one of our young people, who couldn't, he couldn't make it tonight, but Kai has actually come back to us, along with Freddie, as a mentor actually mentoring their peers through the process of learning how to code. And Kai, he's actually uh, employed full-time at the Boston Globe at the moment. And he told me once, he said, Dell, I came home from work, and there were two of my friends bragging to each other about how much money they made that day hustling drugs. And he said he told them how much money he made that day building software. And apparently just killed the conversation. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, these are my investors. These are my investors. This, to me, is the future of Boston's tech ecosystem. So I have a theory of change that our young people, we have these guys up here, we have a couple more in the audience, and we have tons more back in Boston. I have this theory of change that these young coders will continue to propel each other to do amazing things. And again, all I have to do is light the spark. But these are the guys that I'm talking about. This is the mission that I'm talking about when I use the word resilient. Thank you so much.